Welcome everyone. Excited to see everybody on a Wednesday. I hope your week has been doing just uh, been amazing. Uh, thank you for putting in the chat where you're from saying hello. We're excited to see everyone from all across the world attending the textile talks. So I am Karen Baker. I'm actually a board member of Surface Design Association and I'm also the founder of Fiber with a Cause. So textiles and entertainment. So this is the textile talk that you've joined today. We are really excited to be able to have this conversation uh, looking at textiles from being in two of the most amazing, largest <laughs> grossing films in 2022, which are called Wakanda Forever and The Woman King. So if you've seen them, just put in the chat that you've seen both of them. If you've only seen one of them, put it in the chat. You know, we're excited to know who's here and, and, and you know, your involvement in the film industry. Also, you know, we want to really show the connection between how fiber and textile and embroidery has been used in costume design and used in time period pieces within the film industry as well. So that is really the purpose of celebrating these artists who a lot of times are behind the scenes. We wanna make sure they get this valuable credit for the work that they've contributed to these two amazing films as well. So again, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Textile Talk, Textile and Entertainment, uh, Wakanda Forever and The Woman King is brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, Sur uh, Studio Art Quilt Association, and Surface Design Association. And then we're happy to be one of the sponsors for this textile talk, Fiber with a Cause. So some quick housekeeping announcements before we go into the presentations. We'll do a Q and uh, question session with the two, and then we'll give you all the opportunity to ask your questions as well. So get ready to throw them into the Q&A. So right now, as you notice, it's a webinar where your mics are not active um, and not showing. So we welcome the questions again. You can put them in the Q&A box. And then this is something that we're honored to be able to do with the textile talks, that they are free and they are a way of inspiring, bringing together this community, which we can do across the globe virtually. So um, if you want to put anything in the chat just to talk to another person, feel free to do that but absolutely put your questions to the panel in the Q&A as well. So if you prefer not to get any notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button um, and toggle it, and then you could turn it on and off. That's your choice as well. Again, it's the benefit of being virtual. So without further ado, we're going to welcome to the presenters for the day, uh, Anika Jones, who is the founder of Art You Hungry, as well as uh, Tivane Mavuma, who is the one of the co-founders of Barry Dale Hand Weavers in South Africa, along with the managing director, Aaron uh, Bastable. So welcome them to Textile Talk, Textile and Entertainment. So before we go into that as well, you see they're now on, on the screen. Hi, Anika. Hi, Erin. Hi, Tivon. <laughs> so before we do that, I'm just going to read a brief bio, and then they're going to present some of their work uh, as well. So let's start with Anika. Anika is Trinidadian-born. I told her before I've been there many times. It's a place that I love. She's a graduate of the University of Tampa and a multidisciplinary artist uh, working in mixed media, as well as embroidery, paint, and textile. One of her most notable achievements was a commission for Time Magazine. If you all haven't seen that, look at that cover. It's amazing. Um, it's artwork that was on the cover for August 31st to September 7th of 2020. She also has work acquired by the Tampa Museum of Art, Florida Craft Art Gallery in Florida, the Furman Center for the Arts, and in other private and public collectors as well. She really uses social impact in her work. If you look at her work and hear her talks as well too. So we're excited to dive into that conversation as well. And I'll just say this, she's under the age of 30 and she's accomplished a lot. <laughs> and on top of that, you know, uh, Marvel Studios commissioned her to do this embroidery piece uh, for the premiere of Wakanda Forever when it aired on Disney Plus. So again, welcome Anika. And then um, T-Vane um, Mavuba, 
is actually a master weaver. I'm always excited to meet master weavers because I weave and I know that craft is no joke. <laughs> and he weaves every single day. So he started at the age of 22 as a farm worker and then had a mentor, uh, Ruby Bergman, who actually turned him in onto the craft of weaving. He's now been weaving for 41 years. Give him a round of applause in the thing for weaving for 41 years. <laughs> and then 17 of those years, he was one of the, the, the founding members of uh, Barry Dale Weavers, um, Barry Dale Hand Weavers. And with that, he's gone on to continue to lead uh, Barry Dale, Dale Hand Weavers. Uh, they have a lot of weavers there as well, too, along with um, Aaron, who is the owner of Barry Dale Weavers as well. And so when he when they initially told me that they did 1600 meters of cloth in a very short amount of time for the woman king it was like we have to tell this story at the same time so again welcome as well so we're going to start out with the presentations and then we'll, uh, we'll do that with Barry Dale uh, hand weavers and talk about the work that they've done the retail portion that they have along with the fact of how they came to be and doing the Woman King. You all take it away. Hello, everybody. Hello from myself and Tavan. Uh, so we're here from South Africa, a small little village of Barrydale, about five, 6,000 people here. Um, so we're quite a big business here. As um, Karen stated, then Tavan, along with Carol Morris, started the business in 2007. It was just Tavan and Carol that started. And today there's 30 people, 15 of whom are weavers. Um, so quite a good uh, local, local story there, weaving story. Um, but we're going to focus on the Woman King and how we ended up getting involved in that. Um, so maybe go to the next slide, please, Astrid. So it sort of, it came out the blue. We've been weaving for a number of years. I, I only bought the business four years ago. Didn't know much about weaving, so I'm still learning. <laughs> but I got a phone call one day from this uh, gazelle Boma. Bohart, sorry, from, and she was talking about, she was making a West African film and she needed some strip weave fabric and could we make something? And I always say, my first answer was always yes. Well, let, show me what you want. I'll send you some samples. Let's see what we can do. I had no idea at the beginning that it was actually a big Sony production with Viola Davis. She just told me it was a West African movie. I thought it was actually maybe like a Nollywood movie of some uh, a, a small movie that's some sort of uh, small studio. So the initial email is here. She said she needed 20 meters, of about a 10 centimeter strip weave. I had to look up what strip weave was. I sent her the samples down to Cape Town, all labeled up there, as you can see, with the standard cloth that we make. And I sort of left it with her. So that was how it sort of started. And this was uh, August 2021. Okay, maybe next, please. So what she sent back was this um, screenshot, which of the strip weave fabric. So for those that don't know, it's a traditional way of weaving um, where you, you weave very small strips of fabric and then sew them together to make garments. So in this particular sort of tunic, you've got lots and lots of bits of strip weave put together. They reckon it's about 16 meters per sort of tunic of this sort of size that you would need. So you cut it into strips and, and sew them together. So this is what she sent back in terms of the, the tunic brief. She, from our color chart, you can see in the sort of top right where she's got the one, two, one, three. She had kind of tried to match the colors that we standardly have, the colors in the tunic. And then you will see on the left there that I, I put forward a sort of proposal based on the thickness of the lines. And um, we'll get onto that in a minute. But it was 16 sets or pegs of 12 cotton is how we set it up. And um, let me go next. So we went back and forth for a while. Here's Devan making our first walk. They, on the right hand side, you'll see four different variations that they sent us. We, we simplified it down to only, um, it was four colors that we looked for the first ones. We were using our indigo and teal and natural, which is our standard colors. And then the introduction of red, which we don't have as a, a standard cotton color. We dye all our yarns in large batches, 160 kilos at a time. So we didn't have any red. Um, so here Tivan's used a warping mill, small warping mill. I think this was That's two meters. Two meters per one. So we were just doing a first, our first warp, just as a test of the color scheme. Um, we didn't have the red. So 
every time we buy a loom, we get given or gifted the leftover yarn that that weaver had. Um, and often we can't use it in our production because we need a, a significant amount of one color. So Tivan's actually got his own workshop and it's, it's full of yarn of all different types. Different types. Correct, from mohair, merino, correct. And so we, he went away to look in his workshop to see if we can find a red. So we did find a poly cotton, a small piece, but we only needed to make 20 meters. So we thought, let's make the test piece from that. So if we maybe step forward. So next, Astrid. So here, just to, this is a bit of an aside, but our warping technique. So if you're, if there's home weavers watching, then obviously you usually use a, a, a sort of board with pegs that you're wrapping the yarn around one, one at a time. This is more of an industrial sort of um, technique whereby we're using, we put the warping mill on its side. If you look at the top right, this is Sibongi Seni. He's one of our junior weavers. He's been here two years. Uh, and every rotation of this warping mill is four meters. What they do is, if you look at the top left, you can see a sort of paddle, or the bottom right even, a paddle where they pass through 12 or 14 pieces of cotton at a time, running off the bales, and then we, we spin that warping mill, and every rotation is four meters. So typically, Sipongi Seni's loom, maybe 20, 30 rotations. Yeah, okay. So he's building it up 12, bits of cotton at a time, 30 rotations, and we'll do that 90 or so times. So it can take a full day to set up a walk. Anyway, that's just a, a little bit of an aside there. <laughs> Let's go to the next here. So, so here on the left-hand side, you see, this is our first walk that we put on. Short four meter walk, you see we've added the red in, and um, we've tied it onto the loom. And on the right-hand side is our finished weaving. We, we, we practiced by, changing the weft. So we could use, we used a single weft, we used a double weft, um, we used natural, and on the bottom right, you can see the color difference with using the indigo, which gives us, which I think was the preference after we sent it to them, they like the darker color coming through. Now you also see that it's wider, the bottom section, and that's because the indigo won't shrink so much because it's a dyed button. Yeah. Okay, next. So actually, after we sent that sample off, um, Giselle phoned me, and this is a, <laughs> this is not the sexy bit. This is the costing and planning, because she she actually phoned me and said, "Look, I was going to send you a message, but I decided I just wanted to hear you fall off your chair, because we've actually we've actually uh, found out that we need a hundred of these tunics. We need sixteen meters per person. So we need now one thousand six hundred meters, not twenty meters. <laughs> so." If you see, so now I had to do a full, and they wanted a specific color of a navy. They didn't like our indigo. They wanted to dye something. So she told me, look, you need to go and tell me what we need to do if we want to dye this cotton, how much cotton we need. So I had to do a, a big calculation to try and figure out how much, what quantity of what colors yarn we need, depending on how much we were able to weave. If you look at the little table that I've blown up at the bottom, I only committed, I said, look, 300 meters we can do. That's the minimum we'll, we'll make. We'll try and go for 600 meters. A stretch target for me would be 900. But uh, <laughs> I called it the dream. To weave 1,600 meters is not going to happen in the time scale they've given us, which was about three months. Uh, so let's go to the next one. So here you can see what we came to is a slight compromise. So she wanted a 10 meter wide strip weave. You'll see in the top right, that was the finalized design that we did. So we simplified it right down. We went for just navy and teal, which helped uh, speed up the warping process yes. because we weren't then using so many colors at one time. Um, we went then, if you look at the left-hand side, what we agreed is that we could, as well as weaving a 10 centimeter wide piece, we could weave 20 centimeters, which meant for every meter of 20 centimeters, it would be equivalent of two of 10. So technically, if we only did 20 centimeters, we wouldn't need to weave 1,600. We'd only need to weave 800. Um, and that's kind of important. We'll see in the next video, uh, next slide, we'll see some videos on weaving. But um, it's kind of important because the speed to weave 20 centimeters or 10 centimeters is about the same. Um, sorry, just on the previous one, there are some... Where is it? 
So this is the 10 centimeter loop here. Yeah. This is Shibong Seni again. So every seven passes of the shuttle, there's about one centimeter. So I think in that, we've maybe seen a centimeter and a half being woven then. And then the right hand side here, this is Lucinda. Uh, Lucinda's been with us for over 10 years. This is the 20 centimeter loop. Yeah, you can see the speed difference between the weavers in terms of experience. But realistically, you can weave 20 a meter of 20 centimeters the same amount of time as it takes for 10 because you're, you're still growing an equal sort of distance. So once we got these two looms set up, which were <laughs> Kibana to go and uh, set them up pretty quickly after we got told there was 1600 meters to do. Yeah. Um, once we got them set up, uh, we started people weaving and people were ever, we were weaving almost seven days a week and uh, nonstop. I had to keep them moving. So we were rotating people onto the limbs. Um, after we'd started that, then if we go to the next slide, we actually got a request for more fabric. Um, this time though, it was from our typical- Beach towel looms. Okay, correct. Yeah, so our beach, what we call a beach towel limbs, we usually make large towels from this. You can see a shot from the film of the actual fabric as it was used on the left-hand side the sort of design. Um, the next videos are gonna show, are gonna um, show the use of the flying shuttle. So that's our standard way of weaving. We don't usually weave by hand. So here we are flicking the shuttle from side to side. Yeah. Um, and got, each of these weaving has been adapted. I could run time with a, There we go. That's Lizzie. She's also been with us over 10 years. One of the original weavers that she ran for it. And then Lucinda again. There we go. So that again is seven, seven throws of the shuttle. It's still a centimeter, but it's a lot faster. It's about three times as fast as by hand. Let me go to the next step. So here's the sort of screenshots of some of the people involved. In fact, I think there was another three or four weavers involved in this as well. Um, I've also got the little uh, chart there of how much we've made of 10 centimeters, how much 20 centimeters. So we were sending it to the Cape Town studio every week. We were averaging there, it's about 70 or 80 meters of 10 centimeter a week and whatever, it's about 30, 30 meters of 20 centimeter. So slowly by and surely, you know, we. Uh, managed to reach actually our target in February of the, well, I say 1582 there. About, we made, we finally managed to make the 1,600 meters um, with a team effort. Maybe we go to the next slide, which is just showing the sort of, the final reward for our actions was actually taking everybody, so that's the whole team on the bottom right there. We took everybody to the, the movies and we actually, due to load shedding here, we wouldn't have been, so load shedding is the power gets turned off. The cinema actually moved the time of the film to accommodate 30 of us to watch the film. So we were the first people in South Africa, yeah, the yeah, yeah. residents. And for our team there, I think only six people from the team had actually been to the cinema before. So there's like 20 plus people that had never been to the cinema. And the first time they go, they see a film with the fabric they've produced. So it was quite a wonderful day. I just want to show finally one little, Clip, if you've seen all the behind the scenes, um, one sort of eight second clip of the actual Woman King, where you can see the fabric that we've, uh, we've made here. Okay. So here you see the actual fabric that we wove. Um, you'll need to share the screen. And right here on the left-hand side, you can see all the guys wearing the blue um, striped shirt. So that's is half the crowd. That was supposed to be a hundred of those that were made. Sixteen Aaron, meters each. Aaron, 16. you'll need to share your screen. We're not seeing oh, it right sorry, now. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. Apologies. Now. Mm -hmm. Sorry, apologies. Yeah, sorry, this is the one I was talking about with all the guys in the, on the left-hand side there. And it's worth noting that on the right-hand side, 
Um, that other fabric was actually woven in Ghana, I believe. Okay. Back in. Okay, well, thanks for listening. And we'll take questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So we'll go on to Anika to do her presentation and then we'll go into questions. Hi, everyone. Ready whenever you are, Astrid. Hello again, everyone. My name is Anika Jones. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about how I kind of transitioned from being a traditional painter into a contemporary embroidery artist. So next, please. I am originally from Trinidad and Tobago. So I was born and raised in Trinidad. And from a very young age, I could tell that I was creative. So that's baby me uh, in Trinidad on the left. And on the right, it's Teenage Me, where I kind of started shifting away from that creative curiosity into thinking that I could actually make a career or possibly become an artist in the future. So I attended Bishop Anstey High School in Trinidad. And most of my work at the time was heavily influenced by everything Caribbean. So not just Trinidad and Tobago. Next slide, please. So much of my early work was uh, mainly paintings and clay work as well. Again, it was reflective of the Caribbean culture. So I used a lot of vibrant colors, a lot of portraiture, um, and then pulling as well from different Afrocentric themes that I would like to focus on and different Afrocentric uh, symbols as well. So on the left is a painting that I had completed as a class assignment. Uh, and then on the right, I'm holding a fountain that I also created out of clay. And it was interesting because at the time, a lot of the things that I did was not only reflective of the Trin Trinidadian culture, but also life in Trinidad and basically just capturing snapshots of everyday life uh, living in Trinidad. Next slide, please. And so for a while, I had focused mainly on kind of honing my skills because again, I had shifted away from just feeling like I was creative, but I really felt like I was coming into my artistic skin. And I worked really hard and actually ended up getting a national scholarship from the Ministry of Education in Trinidad and Tobago. And that allowed me to study in the United States. So I didn't wanna go anywhere that was too cold because remember I'm Caribbean. So I need somewhere that's like the weather is similar. And I actually ended up choosing Florida uh, the University of Tampa was where I went to school for my Bachelor of Fine Arts. And what I really, really, really enjoyed about that program was that although I was interested in painting, they allowed you to take multiple different classes um, that kind of play into my practice now. So I took painting, I took digital art, I took photography, mixed media, and they would often bring different artists into the classroom as well. So different professional artists who had their own practice, who were having shoes, who were doing things out in the real world, not just in a classroom setting, they were able to bring that into the classroom. So it sparked my interest even more just in terms of me being an artist, but also from the side of me being a painter, I was very inquisitive and wanted to learn more and eager to learn more about painting. Next slide, please. And so with this interest in painting, I actually started taking a lot of painting courses, intro to painting, and even kind of pushing myself further into a mixed media course. And that's where my work kind of pivoted from just being 2D, flat, and on a canvas to me actually putting things onto the canvas, bringing texture into play as well. And on the left, you see me painting uh, this circular texture, it's actually, those are condoms that I've adhered to the canvas. And that's my that was my first introduction to mixed media where I noticed that 
as an artist, it was important for me to pay attention to the material that I was using within my pieces. And so those condoms were symbolic of many different victims of sexual abuse and human trafficking. And it was a good way for me to step outside of my comfort zone as an artist and as a painter and start seeing the canvas and that flat surface as more of a 3D or three-dimensional uh, space where stories could exist and different narratives can start to come out and viewers could start interacting with the piece in a different way. Next slide, please. And with that curiosity in terms of the paintings and me wanting to dig a little bit further into that three-dimensional aspect, I actually took an experimental painting class at the University of Tampa, thinking again that I was just going to learn more on honing my skills as a painter, as a hyper-realistic painter, and different ways of being free with paints. But that class actually changed my life because it removed paints completely and allowed the students to do a little bit more research and do a little bit more thinking into everyday materials that we use that most times people don't consider art or they don't consider it contemporary art. And that's how I got into embroidery. So what I did was I picked up a pack of thread from Walmart and decided, you know what, I'm gonna switch out my paints for thread and see how I can use this to make a painting without using any paints. So this was me really stepping outside of my comfort zone, removing paint completely and kind of starting to get into fiber arts and embroidery. Next slide, please. This was actually my first embroidered portrait. So I decided to do a self-portrait just because I didn't know how it was going to turn out. I knew that I had different classes prior that taught me how to lay a painting onto a canvas, but I actually didn't have any prior knowledge with embroidery or fiber art with no formal training. So all of this was very experimental for me. So picking myself as the subject was a safe option, but still stepping outside of my comfort zone. And you can see on the left, this was actually the first stitch that I had ever made. Uh, and I'm glad that I took that picture. Uh, but you can see the outline of the areas as I usually break down a portrait into pure color. So for me, most people would typically see my embroidery work and they would think that it's a painting, but it's typically because I break it down into different sections of color just to simplify that process. Next slide, please. And so as I continued and I got a little bit more comfortable, I started playing again with not only the portraiture and the texture of the fibers, but also the colors and the symbolism of the bullseye and bringing that uh, aspects of storytelling back into my pieces, focusing on a, a series of works that I called targets, where again, I was highlighting victims of sexual abuse and sex trafficking, but using fiber and embroidery thread in a way that I'm metaphorically and literally breaking the edge and the border of the canvas um, and kind of finding different ways of doing what traditional artists would do in storytelling and kind of flipping that narrative and doing it in a contemporary sense. Next slide, please. And so this was actually the self-portrait that the Tampa Museum of Art had collected. Just a, a view of the front and the back of the canvas because I don't work with any machinery, simply just a needle and thread. And so I use both of my hands as I'm sewing. Uh, pushing from the back of the canvas to, through the front of the can canvas and then through the back again. Um, so it's a very repetitive process of me sewing with both of my hands, but also threading the needle over and over and over and over again. Next slide, please. So you can see here that my work typically ranges in scale, and I started to incorporate a bunch of different techniques and even push the boundary a little bit further with not just using embroidery thread, but also incorporating things like zippers. The piece on the left was added to the permanent collection for the Florida Craft Art Gallery. Um, and these pieces for me were actually uh, interesting to see how my work transitioned from that very first painting that I showed you guys where I felt like at the time I was using such vibrant colors. But 
the more that I got into embroidery was the more that I realized, and it's funny that you can't mix colors with thread, but how vibrant my pieces got over time, uh, the increase in saturation and just how, how much of the color is present in my pieces. And so I think that's why people are drawn to my work and that's kind of how it caught the, the eye of um, the art director at Time Magazine as well as Black Panther. Next slide, please. So this is just a combination of my pieces where I started to incorporate a lot more than just my hands and embroidery thread, working uh, with fabric as well, focusing on silhouettes. And again, all of these are hand sewn and the backgrounds are painted. So it's almost like my work kind of flipped to the opposite where I used to focus mainly on the faces being painted uh, but now the entire face is embroidered and the background is painted, kind of like adding a complementary uh, aspect to it. Uh, and I like that contrast of viewers being able to see the soft uh, glowiness of the acrylic paints versus the rough texture of the thread as well. Next slide, please. So this was actually the commission that I received from Time Magazine for the cover issue, uh, August, September, 2020. I actually had just graduated, I think three months. Uh, so I was graduated from the University of Tampa for three months and I received an email that was entitled uh, Artwork Needed for Time Magazine. And I first thought it was a scam because I was like, there's no way that as a recent graduate, as a recent student, that they would be interested in my work being on the cover of Time Magazine, but it was true. And for me, this again was a pivotal moment in noticing and understanding the power of fiber arts and the power of uh, textile artists and fiber artists in, because they could have simply just used a digital artist or a painter, but it, this was during the time that there was so much chaos with the pandemic and everything that was going on in the world, that the fact that I'm using embroidery thread and stitching that story um, and almost like a rebirth of that American flag, it was important at the time. And it was important for me to recognize this because it helped me in continuing to stitch and continuing to know that fiber art is important, not just in a space where people think of it as a domestic hobby, but it actually being art and having the power to impact people in a different way. Next slide, please. And so that led to, of course, the Black Panther Wakanda Forever as well, where typically for uh, these promotions for movies and publications as big as this, you would see something like a digital animation, but they actually show the process of me stitching from start to finish, um, even drawing the outline as well on the canvas. So I was grateful that as a fiber artist, I was given the platform to present this work of art, but also it being a platform for many other fiber artists as well to start coming into this space and showing that this was more than just um, a piece of artwork for this publication or for this. Uh, promotion, but it showed the power that fiber artwork has and the impact that it can make in getting people excited about a movie and getting people to come together and focus in more on the power of art and not just its aesthetic and its beauty, but the stories that it can really tell and entail. Next slide, please. And so this is a little bit uh, more of behind the scenes of me sketching everything out and putting in those first few stitches. I do have a video that Astrid will attempt to show to you. Hopefully it works.
I'm not not sure if it's playing. If not, maybe we can put the link in the chat so that you guys can reference it. Yeah, if it doesn't work, that's fine. We can put the link in the chat. We put the link in the chat so you all awesome. can grab it and take a look at it as well, too. Um, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I told you all she was amazing. <laughs> so let's come on and let's um, start to deal with the questions that we have. We have quite a few that have been put in on top of the ones I have. So I'll shorten mine so that you all can get to all the questions because they are very specific um, questions. So um, Tivon, we're ready to go and then we'll get started. A lot of questions are coming around, uh, which was one of the questions I had around the color palette, if there was a dyeing process that went on as well with the weaving for the woman king and then the process that you have as far as how you choose your colors uh for the the work that you actually end up um executing um so nika i'll let you go first of course and i think that that's an excellent question again from a painter shifting into a uh, contemporary embroidery for me, it was a challenge in the beginning with choosing my color palettes because as a painter, it was easy. I was able to mix a color if I wanted to, uh, or I already had that color that was presented. Whereas with thread, it's a little bit different. If I want a specific color, um, I either have to dye the thread myself, or I have to find a way that I can overlap different fibers of the thread so that when you stand back from the piece to your natural eye, it will give off the illusion that it is a certain shade or depth. Um, for example, if I'm doing a shadow on the face and I need a darker shade of blue. Uh, so kind of learning to layer as well. But for me, it was really simplifying the colors that I see within my portraits, making sure that I'm breaking it down into just color and not just recognizing it as this whole solid face, because then it makes it very complex. And that just makes the process a lot easier for me. Very cool. Because again, like I said, to the eye, they look like a painting, you know, the, and particularly when it's photographed. Um, and I think, again, your painting skills are definitely a blessing in, in, you know what I'm saying, bringing in these two art forms together, for sure. And then, um, Tivon, when we talk about, you all use plain weave. So how do you create the texture along with, do you go through any dyeing process of the yarn as well, too? No, so the dye, yeah, we don't do dyeing yet. I think you've been involved in some dyeing and spinning before, a long time ago. Spinning, cotton, wool, all things. It's more on the weaving. Start okay. With the okay. So how so do you achieve it's the It's also texture? very difficult. That with that, thin, yeah, with that thin yarn, you can't. Um, we send it to do to Cape Town. You need special machines to do the reactive oh, dye. You can't do that in a hand dyeing process. It's too thin, you know, too fine. And then okay. with the tech, but with the texture, but with regard to getting that texture, yeah, well, it's literally probably something more than a thousand in Italy. Yeah, it comes with the machine. But to get the texture in the fabric is about varying um, weft and warp. Weft and warp. Yeah. Okay. So the one the, in our towel towel weave. People are always surprised it's just a plain weave, but there we're using a double um double weft. A double weft. So when it when you put it through the shrinking process, it pulls up and actually becomes like almost like a diamond pattern. Um, but it's actually just a plain weaving. So it's through the shrinking process as well. Okay, beautiful. So there's a question for um Anika as well. Um, someone asked, do you use other embroidery stitches besides short and straight stitches? No, I don't. Throughout the entire thing, it's just long and short uh, stitches and that straight stitch stitch technique. Um, like I said, I don't have any formal training. So for me, it was just an experimental thing. And what worked at the beginning, I kind of stuck with as I went along. Okay, wonderful. And then the last question, I guess it'll piggyback off of that um, as well, is how many strands of floss do you use was the question. That's a great question. It actually ranges depending on the area that I'm working on. So the thread that I use, it can split, I think, into sometimes five strands and sometimes six strands. 
if it's an area that I want very thick uh, texture, I'll use all six, but typically I'll break it down into two. And then for areas of detail, let's say I'm working on an eyelash or something or an eyebrow, just to show those uh, hairs within the eyebrow, I'll use one. You all get a lot of the detail. Great questions though, <laughs> on top of that. But it's a curiosity. We talked a little bit, uh, Tivon, about your start that you've been 41 years in. I'm curious about Anika and your experience um, and how textile and fiber really brought you into your work today. So what was the inspiration? What was the motivation that made this become an art form for you all to be part of? You want to go, Anika? Yeah, because I think they may be frozen. Um, so for me, again, I think it was that moment of taking that experimental painting class where I, it like it was almost like a switch or a light bulb moment because for a while I was following that norm and that tradition of what we typically do as traditional artists. Whereas that class helps me to pivot my thinking into knowing that we can use everyday, everyday materials and not just everyday materials in looking at fiber artwork, because most times fiber art is sometimes considered as a hobby or something that's more crafty and not really seen as fine art. And for me, within my work, I'm trying to change that narrative. So it was that moment of taking that class and that light bulb moment of noticing, OK, I don't have to follow what other artists are doing. And in me doing that and experimenting and seeing how the first portrait came out, this is something that I could possibly continue doing and continue uh, changing and evolving as I go as an artist. Wonderful. You all are back. We have to remind people that uh, Aaron and Tivon, they're like eight, six hours ahead of us. So it's almost nine o'clock at we're night. In, we're <laughs> in so the deepest, darkest internet. Africa. We just came, the internet came back on. It went off between four and six. It's now almost nine o'clock. But um, it's supposed to be on and be working. But yeah. it's, it's just Murphy's Law. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just the differences so people are clear to understand. So, uh, but I'll give you this question so people can ask. They asked if, um, was there any negotiation that went on in removing some of the final product colors for the Woman King? Did you all have to negotiate anything in order to deliver the work the way it that was, you know it would be? It, that, it actually just comes down to cost in the end because if they wanted all the they would have had to pay for all these big dye batches um because you have to dye them at such a significant amount so actually um yeah and then lead time that would have also delayed us so we we had to get started um so i know that they went yeah they went to ghana to get those colorful ones for the the, the other colorful ones cool. and then another question was about care you know with the amount of yards really and meters that you had to deliver what do you what were you able to do or what do the weavers do to make sure they take care of their hands and their wrists and even their body to produce that amount of work what do you think weaving makes you stronger that's what Tim and I'll tell you <laughs> if you weave if you weave for 40 or 45 hours a week you're already yeah. strong your wrists know what they're doing yeah the first time you feel the pain the, the muscle is keeping tall the sharper it's a little bit ahead it takes it more or less it's about 20 grams the weight of it. As you throw it every time, you know, each throw it, you must switch it off the shaft and all the thing. Yeah, definitely you have that feeling. But after that, maybe a week, three weeks, and then everything comes normal. Muscle, you got muscle <laughs> memory. <laughs> so you got some strong, there's some strong people there. And um, you saw Lizzie and Lucinda when they're doing the flying shuttle, they've both been there over 10 years. And um, there is a break between Actually, there's only so fast you can, you only weave a section, then you get down off your loom, you have to reset, like roll it on. You will take breaks during the day for, for making bobbins and stuff. So there's no, yeah. you know, but if if you master your technique, then it is actually quite light. It can, you get into a rhythm and things are swinging, you know, like the swinging, the beat swing, yeah. and it's already a pendulum, you're just keeping it moving. Keep it moving. Just and your legs are up and down. So you, you need to be fit, but I think you find your rhythm. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, 
Now, one person asked, Vanessa asked, did you realize the magnitude and impact of your work? That was one of my questions. I'm going to let you all start, Tevon and Aaron, because I'll say this. Uh, when Aaron and I first talked, it was early part of this year. Magnitude and impact of the work? No, he didn't. I was determined that the 300 and something of you all sitting here were going to learn about Barry Dale Hand Weaver's work. I was like, because there's no way people can not know that this many weavers were behind the scenes doing this level of work because they hadn't told really anyone. So I can partly mm -hmm. answer that is the reason why they're sitting here because I told really, Aaron, really, I'm really. making my duty yeah. to make sure that people hear what you all have done. But you talk about learning the magnitude and impact of your work. I'll let you all go first then, Anika. I think the first, like, as I first stated, when she first said 20 meters and we didn't even know what the film, I didn't even ask what the film was. She was just, because it was a small time studio in Cape Town, I didn't think of it. And then it was only after, you know, we were talking for a couple of weeks, I was making the first samples when we first sent them and I said, look, sorry, can you tell me a bit more about this film? She said, oh no, it's a Sony production. It's starring Viola Davis. Then you realize, oh, this is, and it's a big time. And I did explain to the team. And they thought, wow, you know, okay. the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how are we going to achieve it? And then I think coming on the big screen, then that's obviously makes, but, but it makes you appreciate because you watch so many films and you never, you do appreciate the whole, um, all the all the work that goes into the makeup and the costumes and all the scenes, but I never really thought about. I mean, it's it's expensive as well. I mean, it costs. It, it was a good it was good work for us. Yeah, sure. Um, and you realize that's just one element of one film, and it's only one of the costumes of a multitude, you know. And then you see the list at the end of the film. We were watching, you know, waiting for it to come up, but you're like, well, there's probably for every name there, there's probably another four names that should be there as well. <laughs> uh, but thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. We're, we're certainly proud. Yeah, sure. Yeah, same here. And Nika, what about you? Because your work has made much impact too. So what was that moment, you know, that made you realize that? You talked a little bit, but it'd be good to hear it. Well, yeah, I think it's different for, for me because I spend a lot of time by myself in my studio. Um, so I'm typically just in my head and focusing on the artwork, but I actually just came back from London for an exhibition that I was having in London. And even up to yesterday, when I came back, people in London were like, I'm following you from your Time Magazine piece. So I'm following you from your Black Panther Wakanda Forever uh, stitched artwork. So me being from a small island, very, very small island, turned out in Tobago, then coming to the U.S., um, mainly just to have an education and kind of further my studies with art, and that leading to creating an American flag on the cover of Time magazine and then going to London outside of America and people, you know, saying that we followed you from the work that you've done. It was kind of me stepping outside of the studio or stepping stepping outside of that time with myself and noticing that, yes, I'm creating the artwork and spending a lot of time on my own, but that impact is much greater um, and people are paying attention. You often think as an artist, hmm, maybe nobody cares or maybe a few people care, but people are paying attention. Um, so it's important as an artist to keep putting your artwork out there because you never know who you're going to touch. And someone asked you, Aniko, the size needles that you use, does that vary? That varies, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I typically work with DMC needles. Um, and I would say size is five to 10, but it, it ranges. So I don't want to give a specific size. Okay. And then, Tivon, the question was, how powerful is it to be a master weaver? That's my question to you. To be a master weaver, it's a process. Actually, you need the respect, training the people also, because the people they make me as a master weaver. Can't be master weaver myself without the weavers. So we have a beautiful team. Always, they take my thought. Always, I try to train them. They taking all each space. They try to make it better than what I do either. Well said. 
I think we got stuck. <laughs> um, and then last question for you uh, as well, Anika. Um, the piece for time that was the American flag, did they request that you do that or that was something that you decided was going to be your contribution? Because that was also, uh, the, the name of that was called the New American Revolution. It was curated by Pharrell Williams, correct? Yes, it was. And so Victor Williams was the, was the art director that reached out to me. And initially we thought, because when he had seen my work on Instagram, that's how he came across my, my artwork, he thought that it was painted. And at the time I was doing all portraits. So when he reached out to me, he was like, okay, maybe we should do a portrait for the artwork. And thinking about one, the timeline, because it was in, I think, three days that we were discussing it. And then before we knew it, it came down to one day, basically one night. And so <laughs> when we were thinking about the portrait, it just didn't feel right for that, that issue and for everything that was going on and everything that it represented. And so we said, you know what, maybe something that's more representational or symbolic of that national pride and that people can relate to and hold on to. And so that's how we came up with the American flag. Uh, and he kind of just left it to me in terms of the creative direction with how I wanted to represent the flag and it leaving it incomplete, changing the colors, um, the texture of it, the positioning of it. So it was collaborative, I would say, uh, but then coming down to the end with 24 hours to stitch uh, the American flag. It was all me after that. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you said it because there's a lot of questions about timing, you know, and how long did it take you to do the piece and then um, Barry Dale Handweavers to do the piece. So what we see, you know, which really become, is becoming an iconic cover and kudos to you for that, took you did in 24 hours. That's the work of an artist, really. You know, people put pressure on us that they don't put on other people, I really feel. So, you know, <laughs> to be able to deliver. And then three months out of school and then you have to do that. That had to be like, you know, a rush as at the end of the day, as well as excitement. Definitely, yes. Um, and nerve wracking as well. But like, again, seeing it from me working at home and kind of just stitching throughout. And then the next, I think it was either the next day or the day after that it was published. Seeing that took all of my pain in my fingers, my wrists and everything away. And it was worth it. So yes perfect so you all give a round of applause please to Anika Jones and Tivon Mavuma and Aaron Bassable because they have done amazing work that a lot of people didn't know about or learning about um, when we talk about entertainment whether it's Time Magazine Wakanda Forever uh, or The Woman King and then actually Barry Dale Hand, we was worked on a movie on Shaka Zulu. We didn't get a chance to talk about that. So, you know, there are textile and fiber artists really involved in entertainment, and particularly in film. And we want to make sure that we provide the opportunity to know that these amazing artists are there. So you all thank them in the chat as well as we close out um, our time for textile talk, textile and entertainment. Again, we want to thank all of our sponsors for supporting the textile talks that happen every Wednesday. The next one will happen next Wednesday. It will be Alex Anderson and Ricky Timms. They'll do Passion for Quilting, um, becomes a resource for the community and it'll be presented by the Quilt Show. But in addition, hold your calendar because on November 3rd, we'll be returning with Holding Space, which as you all know, has been something new added to Surface Design Association is a bit brought to by the Equity Access um, and Inclusion Committee, which I sit on as well too. Uh, so we'll be bringing that on November 3rd and have a chance to talk about uh, disability and artists who are considered moving in the space of disability culture and how they are as equally as important and have need to have the same rights as any other artists in textile and fiber as well. So we thank you all for coming today. This will be available um, as a recording for some things. I know some people miss some things going in and out. This will be available as a recording so you can see some questions that were answered that you put in the chat as well. And again, thank you all. Thank you for joining us as our speakers. 
and you all support them. All their information is in the chat. So support their work and continue to see what they're doing. And then thank you again, um, Surface Design Association for allowing Fiber with the Cause to be a sponsor of today. Thank you all. Have a good day.